Hey, everyone. Before this show gets started, I wanted to take an opportunity. You know, we recorded some of these episodes early. And so we, you know, it was before we had everything done, all of our Twitter feeds and our RSS and our website all set up. So we may not have a lot of time to talk about it in these episodes that you hear, but we just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for subscribing to the show and uh, listening to what we have to say. All of our stuff is available. So if you're interested in checking out our subscription or a way to contact us, you can check out our website, gowiththeheat.com. You can email us at gowiththeheat at gmail.com. And we're on all the major platforms. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr. You can find our individual Twitter accounts on our website too. So make sure to go check it out. And thanks again for everyone. We recorded these a little bit earlier. So I just want to take a moment to say thanks and uh, give a little plug for how you can get a hold of us. Enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat, an enthusiast guide to the 1980s cultural phenomena that was Miami Vice. I'm Dominic and joining with me with, is my brother John and my sister Jenna. And today we're going to be discussing episode four of season one, Cool Running. Before we jump into things, I'd like to see what's going on with each other. John, how are things going up in the greater Seattle area? It is going great and uh, I am enjoying it. It is full-on NBA and hockey playoffs. Unfortunately, both my teams are out at this point. Oh, uh, but... sports ball. Uh, sorry. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, that is, uh, I am getting getting all nerded, sports nerded out for playoff yeah. time. Yeah, didn't the NFL draft just happen too? I heard something about that, like some blip on Twitter it or something. It did. It did. And there's a little controversy with Chief fans. We, uh, we we have a we made a questionable pick about a guy with a questionable past, and Chief fans don't seem don't seem to be too happy about it. So, but that's another story for another vlog. <laughs> All right, and let's check in with Jenna. How are things going in the nerd capital of the world in San Francisco Bay Area? Things are good. I am just trying to get myself settled from traveling for a few weeks. And trying to get myself back in the frame of mind to start work again, go back into the city, <laughs> surround myself by all of those nerds. Yeah, I mean, I've been reading so much stuff about how there's list after list of people saying they can't wait to leave the Bay Area. So it sounds like in the next three to five years, there might be a good chance to soak up some rental properties in the Bay Area. Oh, definitely. I mean, it. you just... I would be wary, right? Because everyone talks about that bubble. And I got to say, being here, it absolutely feels like that's the case. So, <laughs> I, I will tell you one thing. you The influx of people from California up here is just insane. Yeah. Um, yeah I meet more people from California up here in Washington than are actually from Washington. <laughs> you know, what's interesting is that I most of the people that I work with are from Washington. That have relocated mm-hmm. to San Francisco. We have some kind of citizen uh, uh, swap <laughs> thing. <going> Relocation <laughs> program. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> well, not much is going on around here. I mean, I got kids. They tell me what to do. I shake my head and go, let's do that thing. And let's get started on our breakdown of this, the fourth episode of season one, Cool Running. All right, so this is a unique episode. We got some stuff to talk about here, in particular, special character names that they chose for this episode. I have to say, this is a departure from what the other, the the last three Miami Vice episodes, or I guess two, however you look at the pilot, because this episode was bad. It was so bad. (laughs) It was incredibly bad. (laughs) So let's, let's, let's... Let's set it up then, because it starts out bad right from the beginning. We're going to open up, and Tubbs and Crockett are on a stakeout. They're hanging out in the most suspicious van van ever. Like, if they weren't cops, the Mm -hmm. cops would have taken them out of the van already. And to be honest, at first, I actually thought they were in the Trans Am next to the van. (laughs) Because that seemed to fit more with their persona. Um, So I actually had to back up. When that scene started and the two vans started chasing each other, I was like, wait, wait a minute. I thought they were in the Trans Am. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was 
I think also one of the only times that Sonny isn't wearing a blazer. Yeah. So he seems oddly casual yeah. and they're just chilling. <laughs> yeah, and and that has been bothering me with this uh with these characters. Why is it that Crockett is the fashion guy? Um it just seems like Tubbs seems like the cooler of the two of the pair. And Crockett's already a football star, a veteran. Like, can't you give some to Tubbs? <laughs> <laughs> well, what I don't understand is that Tubbs, Tubbs changes. Be, something... Tubbs oh, changes. Uh, did, did we lose you? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm still here. <laughs> Tubbs changes outfits like five or six times in a given episode, and Sonny never changes his outfit. Oh yeah! In oh this no, episode, no, no! He, he changes they... three times. Hmm. Yeah, really? I mean, it, the, most of this episode takes place in just one day. Yes. So we start off the episode. He has a sleeveless turquoise shirt on, white pants, and loafers with no socks. He is my so, fashion hero. So. Yeah, and that's he's in a dirty van down by the river. Why is he dressed? <laughs> Like he's going to the club. <laughs> so let's set this up. They're out there in this van, and it's it's the most suspicious van ever. And they're hanging out in it, and they're watching. There's a deal going down, and supposedly Switek and Zito, the B team, they had uh, found out that this deal was going to go down, but and so they're watching it. And the deal goes bad. Like, and I say bad, like you see, like. Or I guess at this time we know like it just goes bad, and they the two guys shoot the two guys in black pants shoot the two guys in white pants, so that you're <laughs> it's easy to identify from like, a distance. <laughs> but before it's that, like skins and it skins and shirts, you know, it's, it's yeah. easy on us. <laughs> they do that nice slow mo close up of the gun, and then a slow zoom in on each of their faces. Mm. Just we're not to there register. yet. We're not oh, there yet. After. We're not there yet. So, so they we're not the, there the, yet. Yeah. So then the two guys jump into a van, right? And and the van just peels out. And and there's been no notification that like the police are chasing them. These two guys just jump in the van. They drive away super fast. And of course, Tubbs and Crockett start chasing them. And they uh uh they're chasing the identical van as if the van it's it's like a copy of the van that Tubbs and Crockett are in just painted nice it uh-huh. almost feels like the vans should be reversed and when they started filming everyone accidentally got into the wrong van <laughs> yeah yeah and they were both parked next to each other like, <laughs> yeah. I, i'm pretty sure the confusion was it was pretty good it's like they almost didn't know which van to run into yeah yeah <clears throat> so they start chasing the Tubbs and Crockett, our duo, is chasing them, and it's like the worst chase fake driving ever. Like, Tubbs is clearly not driving anything. He's just, like, moving the wheel, right? And Crockett, he's mm-hmm. doing, he's trying to do, like, I'm intensely acting without saying anything. You know, I'm I think just... that at one point he uh-huh. jumps himself up on the seat, like, as though they hit something yeah. or, like, yeah, we're yeah. pulling a tight <laughs> turn. But it just looks like he's moving himself around in the seat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So and and then that's when that scene happens, Jenna, that they slow mo throw open the back doors to to the gun. And then the slow mo zo- zoom on Sunny is not enough. They have to zoom back out, then pan over and zoom in on Tubbs too. Yeah, who so looks the... totally unamused. <laughs> like <Yeah. laughs> so the bad guys. They throw open their back vans, and there's a guy. He's got like a semi auto gun, and he's aiming it, and it just they're gonna shoot. Tubbs and Crockett, and it just goes into this. It's not like it's not even they filmed it for slow mo. It was like they decided later, like in editing, like we need like thirty extra seconds for this episode. Can you slow this down a little bit? Uh-huh. <laughs> so actually, and so and this becomes a theme in this episode with the awful, awful slow mos. Mm-hmm. Is that reading about the episode, the director chose for this episode. He wanted to do every action scene. In a slow mo, <laughs> really? That was yes. He actually chose to do this. That he wanted to do every action scene in a slow motion. Um, I don't know, maybe to add drama. That was actually done on purpose. Wow. Well, that explains a lot. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, because consistently, I continually write down awful, awful slow-mo throughout this entire episode. So afterwards, I looked it up, and yes, he did that on purpose. What's strange with their crash in the beginning is that it looks as though they slow moed a scene that they were actually driving in slow motion because mm-hmm. the van just sort of slowly creaks up that little hill yeah. of like crap and then uh, rolls back. It's down. almost like at one point, like it's not going to make it. <laughs> so it's going to roll backwards. And I kept thinking like, if you're going to do slow-mo, like make it something big and flashy, like really crash the van. But instead it's just like, do 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 like rolls yeah. back. Yeah. To set the scene, so the bad guys shoot at the van. Tubbs loses control, and we don't see that the van actually lose control. All we see is the end result. So the van is going in slow motion towards a tractor, unlike the most OSHA violated job site ever, where there's a tractor <laughs> with its bucket up in the air right at windshield level, uh-huh. uh, and yes. the van crashes into it. And I'm, I'm. Like pretty sure that the reason why that van is traveling so slow when it crashes it because that's slow motion. It's slow motion and the van going slow is that it was too unsafe to have anyone in the van, so they they just let the van roll. <laughs> with no one in it. Yeah, they just got out and pulled the parking brake. <laughs> like at one point, you expect the van to roll backwards. <laughs> the van actually does roll backwards. <laughs> So to, to close out that scene, in the morning after all the investigation done, we find out that Switek and Zito, the B team, they had the they were doing a wiretap on the guys who got killed, and they there was like some third party that called in and said that they wanted to make the deal sooner, and that's kind of how we got here. They don't know who who that third party is, and we make it through the opening credits. The reason I want to move on, because we're probably going to take a little bit of time talking about this scene, too. We jump to a party on Crockett's boat, and it's a police party. Yes. Oh, yeah. So it's a cop yes. party, which and is which is the most. twenty nine ninety five 95 lobsters. <laughs> yeah. So the, the, what's interesting about this party scene to me is that, like, aren't they all supposed to be undercover cops? And they're partying on an open air boat on the boat <laughs> that they use for their stings? Okay, but what's it matter? Because at this point, like by the time you reach the party, they've already been sitting on the scene of the crash from the opener, and mm-hmm. there's a photographer on site taking pictures of them <laughs> <laughs> with, and like and like recording live video for the news or whatever. So obviously undercover, and that's a theme throughout this whole episode. There are multiple times where they're just walking around with the cops where someone's yeah. videotaping them. So apparently mm-hmm. not an issue. Yeah, apparently not. Yeah. Criminals so. don't watch the news. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, apparently not. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I put it on here. Vice cops, though, very fancy parties. <laughs> yeah. Like, here they are, all these vice cops partying on a yacht, having lobster and drinking expensive champagne. Like, yeah. Wow. It so. must be nice to be a vice cop. Oh, yeah, dude, they're partying. They're having a great time. They're all there, and including two new guys who are Bobby and Jake. They're two new guys who we have never met before, and they and in this, they make a bet, like, who's going to bring down the most perps, right? Is, is it the most, or is it a certain one? I think I think it's just bringing down the most, it's, right? It was bring down the most, yeah. yeah. I, well, I thought it was bring down the most weight, as in oh, yeah, most yeah, yeah. drug weight. Yeah, yeah. So these two strangers come out of nowhere. We've never seen them before. And you make a bet. And as soon as the bet was over, like, oh, these guys are dead. Right. Yes, exactly. Don't worry. You don't have to remember their names. They're not going to be around long. (laughs) These are the red shirts of this episode. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. Yes. (laughs) So. And 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 this becomes a theme. So they still suck at their job. Apparently, backup is still optional. Mm -hmm. Um. Because we once again have two undercover cops who are killed, and there's not another cop within 20 miles of them during this ha- <laughs> yeah. when this happens. Yeah. So at this party, but before we get there, at this party, Tubbs is, I mean, he's, he's supposed to be drunk, right? That's, that's what he's going for. And he's got the really expensive lobster. I guess they're all just going to eat the one lobster, right? That he's like scaring all the people on the boat with. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah that I mean, lobster is not lobster, enough lobster like, for that's everybody. Enough. Yeah. 
Yeah, thirty dollars. It better be enough. (laughs) (laughs) So Tubbs drunkenly stumbles forward and drops the lobster into the the uh, water below the the boat that they're partying on. And at that point, I was like, "Oh, that's how this episode's gonna go." Yes, this was very much the the attempt at humor episode i guess yeah 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 it's like uh, i I have my notes it's like apparently this is supposed to be funny question mark Uh (laughs) uh-huh you know and actually on a side note this is the point in the episode where i actually start to think like maybe female tone and cockett are going to be going to get more screen time this episode Mm -hmm. they seem they are they're already involved early on in the episode they already have speaking parts Mm-hmm. Maybe this is the episode they finally join the team. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so we we jump from there and we go to it's like the next morning and they're, they're at their sting warehouse, you know, like where, where they're buying and selling stolen goods, right? And mm-hmm. uh, they're there with Switek and Zito, and they're asking Zito how, how 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 they got this information on the deal that had happened the day before, where. Or the two nights ago, I guess, when those guys got killed, they were saying that they there was some third party called and that wanted to buy. And then the door, they hear a sound and they're like, okay, back to it. Act like we're criminals. And the door opens and in walks the Nugget. hair guy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Here comes Noogie. Noogie has the got man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Noogie, Noogie's got the hookup on everything. He's got sunglasses. He's got speakers. He's got, you name it, he's got it back at the warehouse. He's smooth talking. He knows everybody. And somehow he's not recognizing that this is a sting. Even with mm-hmm. the with Zito behind the counter struggling to put a tape in the VCR. Like yes. a serious struggle too. <laughs> I don't understand uh-huh. why that's so hard. Isn't that what he because does? Because they go in so many different ways. Yeah, right. I mean, they are definitely the B team for a reason. Apparently, yeah. So, so, so these, yes, and once again, they all still suck at their jobs. Yeah, yeah. Hey, hey, but Noogie don't care. Noogie's got shit to sell, and he's looking for buyers. And Noogie, they he talks him out of that, and then. The Zito, even while trying to adjust the camera for who knows what reason, pushes the glass lens out of their fake TV. <laughs> mm-hmm. Noogie could then, be more stereotypic. Yeah. Noogie's yeah. got a way out of this. He's going to sell you some shell pink underwear. <laughs> <laughs> Noogie is like probably one of the few redeeming qualities of this episode. Oh, the only redeeming yes. quality of this episode. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, Noogie gets caught, they arrest him, and we jump back to the precinct, and in comes Tubbs and Crockett with Noogie in handcuffs and a paper bag over his head. <laughs> yeah, the paper bag. That is just awesome. <laughs> Which must be, like, transparent, and we just don't realize it, because he's looking around and making comments of things that are well above <laughs> where the bottom of that bag is. <laughs> yeah. And I understand what they're trying to do. Like, it's supposed to be a secret. Like, their super crime-fighting headquarters is supposed to be a secret, and they can't see who else is in the office, right? Like, they're not allowed to see that. But even though everyone in there is using their regular names. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, he's like yelling across, like, "Hey, Gina, what's going on, Tubbs?" Like, just <laughs> yeah, yeah, what's up, girl? <laughs> and then everybody leaves to go listen to the recording, and they just the lady's just like filing shit in the corner, doesn't care. Like, he's not tied down to anything, or like, or like being monitored oh, yeah. at all. Yeah, he's not handcuffed. So, uh, in comes someone's like, "Hey, we have the recording uh, to, to listen to." Which did we? Just- jump no no we uh they're gonna listen to a recording of um the phone call right it, it, right yeah so everyone just gets up and leaves they go into the office to go l- listen to the recording and they leave noogie's left out there with the secretary he's under arrest for selling stolen goods right he's got a paper bag on his head and yeah. no handcuffs yeah mm-hmm. 
So they all go in yeah, there to they, listen to I the mean, phone call, and of course, Noogie gets his hands on the police report that's still sitting on the typewriter. Right. So, and then in that same scene, we see Crockett and Gina, and they're like, oh, no, I love you more. And Gina's yeah. like, no, no, I love you more. Gina and Sunny action. All right. <laughs> And at this point, I still think that they would be involved in the episode moving further. Yeah. yeah, yeah no, yeah, I had let go Trudy's of, it, I had in let there go too. of any notion that Trudy and Gina were going to be involved in this episode. <laughs> so, and at that time, like, for some reason, he's like, Crockett's making googly eyes at Gina, and then he decides to open his mail. Oh, that's right. Trudy g- gives it to him, right? Trudy gives him a yes. piece of mail, and inside of there yes. is the official court pr- pr- proceedings for his divorce from Caroline. So this yes. episode really bothered me. I mean, not only was it just terrible, just like a terrible episode, but the whole time, even when the writing or something may have gotten bad in one of the other episodes, Sonny's been wonderful for me. Like, I love Sonny. And now he's very want my cake and eat it, too, where he gets all butthurt about the divorce. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, he's like all over his co-worker in the hallway. So what, what's the problem? Yeah. Yeah. He's totally trying to pretend like it's not bothering him. But you can see like, oh, this hurts. It really pisses me off that he wants to be able to like ha- throw his cool parties and make out with Gina and still not have his marriage be dissolved. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I have a I have a different but similar issue with the divorce he's going through. Um. So when he sits down with the lawyer and his future ex-wife Caroline. Okay. So we're jumping um, to let's let's just jump. It, Oh uh, no no no! We 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 got a lot of stuff in between that. So so, go ahead. Okay, well let me just say with the divorce that it that the main issue they point out is who gets custody of the kid and apparently and I guess who gets custody of Elvis. Um, might as well throw him in there. Um, <laughs> Crockett owns Crockett owns a speedboat, a sailboat, and a Ferrari, and yet like. He gets to keep all that. Like the only big thing is about custody because she wants to move to Atlanta. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Were, yeah. Were, were divorces different? Were divorces different back in the eighties? Because I'm pretty sure if he got divorced now, she would get the Ferrari and the speedboat. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I really what? felt for Caroline in this episode because. Yeah, we can talk more about it later. Yeah, but. yeah. Let, let's talk more about her when when we get to that scene because I have a, a an opinion about that too. So we close up with with them at the precinct. Uh, Noogie has a copy of the of the write up, and he uh, he's convinced his Tubbs and Crockett that he might have information on someone named uh, Desmond Maxwell. Who is turns out that that's who they're looking for. So they believe Noogie. They found a good informant that he that that he knows some people and he's gonna go take them and maybe be able to set set them up with Desmond. So we jump to them walking mm-hmm. down the street and they're in Jamaica Town, which actually is kind of cool that they got a Jamaica Town in Miami. I mean, maybe they don't, but it's kind of cool if they did. Yeah, but back at their Uh being terrible undercover cops again, they're (laughs) obviously roughing the Noog man up and (laughs) and threatening him like you're gonna go back to jail loudly while they're walking around in (laughs) Desmond's territory. Like, come on. Little known fact. Okay, I don't know if you guys noticed this, but in the reflection of the store windows, you can see the guy pushing the camera. I no. really need to look up now and see if they ask this director to do any more episodes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure this is the last one. Because <laughs> now we have slow-mos and we have a guy pushing a camera reflecting in the window. Yeah, This yeah. is total like I, B-movie <laughs> yeah. um, type stuff here. Yeah. Horrible. So, so while they're walking down the street, the Nook man is telling them that uh, – he knows where he likes to hang out and he likes to play dominoes on it was like tuesday or something like that it's like it's tuesday he loves playing dominoes and he's like trying to convince them that he's all in and he does that little act where he's like you know i'm gonna help you right now and if i don't then let the lord strike me where i stand he throws himself on the ground (laughs) 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm telling you, he is the one redeeming part of this entire episode. <laughs> yeah. So we jump to the Domino's Club, where supposedly, according to, to Noogie, that's where Desmond likes to hang out. And he points out to uh, the guys, he's like, that right there, that's Desmond's main man. That's his right-hand man, and I'm going to go talk to him. You guys wait here. Uh, and I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go. He goes r- running after him, and I don't know how, like, he's gonna go talk to him while he's in the bathroom, right? And, and mm-hmm. again, they're such good vice cops that they just let him go unattended <laughs> yeah. into a closed room, yeah, yeah. So, after a few minutes, the main guy comes comes walking out, and there's no nook man, and so then they go running into the bathroom like cops would, you know, and they realize that. Noogie has climbed out the window and he's running down the street. Uh, the Noog man escapes out the window in the bathroom and they go chase after him, but they catch up to him real fast. And when they catch up to him in the car, he just throws himself on the ground. Like, yeah, hey, I'm going to run him over. This show gets started. I wanted <laughs> just, to take an opportunity. You know, we over recorded over some of these and episodes and early. And so, we, you know, <laughs> yeah. before we had so everything then, done, like, all of our Twitter saying, feeds like, and our RSS and our they're website all set up. So, we may not have a lot of time to talk about it in these episodes that you hear, but we just want to say thank you. Thank you, the thank trunk you and like, for subscribing the to the show and to uh, listening to what we have to say. Mm-hmm. All of our stuff is available. So if you're interested in checking out <laughs> our subscription <laughs> or a way to contact <laughs> us, you can check so out our website, gowiththeheat.com. Right? You can email they, us at uh, like, gowiththeheat at gmail.com. They mentioned in the and on all the Crockett mentions you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr. You can find our individual Twitter accounts on our website, too. So make sure to go check it out. Once again, for everyone, we recorded these a little bit earlier, so I want to take a moment to say thanks Give a little plug a little for how you later, can get a hold of us. Enjoy the show. While they're in the Jamaican club, they're playing it, uh, Bob Marley jamming. Uh, Bob Not Marley yet. and the Wailers. Oh, no, that's later. Not yet. Not yet. Oh, is that? Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. We, we, we got a little bit for that. So they leave from there. Nook, the Nook man's in the trunk. Crockett's driving. They pull up to where they're going to drop it off. Like, then they, didn't, they don't take Noogie just straight back to the precinct. <laughs> They go do other shit with him in the trunk. <laughs> yeah. And Crockett just parks wherever he wants to. Like, he pulls up on the curb. It's like, it's clearly still in the intersection. He hops out. Tubbs hops in the driver's seat. And Crockett goes walking in to have the lunch meeting with the lawyer and Caroline to talk about the – and signing the papers for the divorce. So this Which, scene, like, seriously bugged me because Caroline – okay – I don't understand where Sunny gets off thinking that Caroline should just stick around. She explains that she gets a good job offer. It puts both her and his son around family and all these other things. Sunny does not have a lifestyle that he can have the, the kids staying with him while he lives on his houseboat with an alligator. Okay. <laughs> and he's out every night, like at all of these like kingpins places drinking and partying and doing whatever. So why wouldn't he be somewhat supportive? She's not asking anything else of him in the divorce. The only thing that she wants is to be able to finalize whatever so that she can move and go for this job in Atlanta and be back by family. It seems super selfish of Sunny to be that way. I don't know. I I was just really, I was really bothered by him in this episode. Especially when in the beginning of the meeting, they're like, so all the assets are already divided. Like, they're already in agreement about that. And, and I think that's what it's ass- supposed to be is that they, like, Crockett didn't want to get his own lawyer. It sounded like they had, like, in his mind, they already had everything worked out. Right. Yeah. So, apparently, his wife was going to get the house, and Crockett gets to keep the speedboat, the sailboat, and the Ferrari. And suddenly, now that she wants custody of the kid, like that's too much. Yeah, so you know, they I, have, I only they have... keep the speedboat, the sailboat, and the Ferrari. <laughs> yeah, they they definitely have split custody, right? It's just that she's got primary custody, and so their son lives with her, and she's going to move to Atlanta. So that means his son is moving to Atlanta, and Crockett is not about that. And he says, like, I'm, you know, like he's making a veil threat, like I'm going to lawyer up too. This is he feels like it's totally out of the blue. Hmm. My other observation from that yeah, scene, I, mean, so I, got, I got two other observations on that scene. One, Crockett does a lot of day drinking and driving. <laughs> like, <he's>, he does. 
<laughs> Especially with people in the trunk, he's doing a lot of day drinking and driving. <laughs> but he's got to be running on a mm-hmm. cool buzz all the time. <laughs> yeah. Also, they oh. didn't when Rodriguez. And, and by the way. Them- when Rodriguez tried to send them home at the beginning of the episode, they didn't. So if this is all still within the same day, he hasn't yep. slept in like more than 24 hours and he's been drinking throughout the day. So mm-hmm. how but he is by the way, navigating. by the way, um, just an outfit update. This is, he's actually changed at some point because this is when he is in a sleeveless peach shirt now, <laughs> not turquoise, but a peach shirt. <laughs> <laughs> with a different pair of white pants and a different pair of loafers without socks. <laughs> so this is outfit number two. My other observation from this scene is this is a setup. So they're, they've they already written out what's going to happen with this divorce stuff. And it got kind of sandwiched into this episode. Like it doesn't really fit for what's going on. But it was important because I have a feeling that this is going to set up and I've kind of I've sneaked a little bit because I wanted to make sure that our episode orders were in right. And I can see that the next episode, this divorce, you know, is take center stage on that. So this was a setup scene for the next two episodes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I I think this is something that because Sonny has a kid and you see it a lot in television shows um, uh, over time, they always do the same thing. Um, because it's a more serious drama, um, the kid's going to get in the way with the show if he's in town. Ultimately, I think all the, this is going to be three episodes to explain why the kid is in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and then that's one less thing that they've got to show in the show. They don't have to cast the kid anymore. Every once in a while, maybe once or twice a season, the kid will show up. But ultimately, they you're not going to wonder, like, wonder where the kid is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I forgot to mention in the previous scene when the Nook man runs away, that's when they catch on him that he's got the the police report for who they're looking for. That's how he had all the all that information. And the Nook man confesses like he doesn't know who who Desmond Maxwell is. He didn't know what was going on. He just didn't want to be there anymore. So they were the, the reason why they put him in the trunk is cuz they were going to take him back to jail then Crockett goes to his lawyer meeting, and right before he leaves, they get a he gets a phone call. Tubbs catches him at the restaurant. He and he get, gets the phone, and he learns that our boys, our red shirts of the episode, Jake and Bobby, have been shot. And I believe it's Jake is the one, or it's Bobby. One of them has been killed. One's and, killed, and one's like in a coma or something. Yeah. So they go. We jump straight to to, to the crime scene. Tubbs is already there. There's like stuff all over the ground. There's a crowd formed around. And now it's personal. Yeah. Oh, that's so funny. I this whole time I had no I for whatever reason I just assumed that they had already dropped the Nug man off. So he's just chilled in the truck <laughs> through all of this. He might be they might have let him out because they're gonna go talk to him in jail. So he he's already in jail. So they Tubbs might have let him out at that point. Gotcha. But they go there. There's Camera crews just, and I'm TV reporters it... everywhere, and there's undercover cops walking around with their badges out. Right. Mm-hmm. Again, the people are walking around with all of their video cameras and everything, and they're just walking right through the shot. Doesn't matter. And what, what I was going to bring up, too, is why is it always necessary for them to go up, uncover the body, and do the whole kneel, look up, like, Why? <laughs> thing. Yeah. Like, 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 oh, all of a sudden now it's personal, you know? Yeah. 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 So this we learned that it's only supposed to be a preliminary meetup, but things got out of control real fast. So Jake's been killed. Bobby's in the ICU. It was only supposed to be a preliminary meetup. And uh, there is a wire recording. One of them was wearing a wire. So there's a recording. So we're going to jump straight to the precinct where they're going to listen to the recording. and. Uh, the tape shows. That um, uh, have we stopped at the uh, prison yet? That's next. Um, didn't they go see? Okay. Yeah, they they haven't seen Noogie yet. They're gonna go see him after a, after going and listening to the recording. So they listen to the recording. They see that Jake and Bobby were being yeah, way I'm too sorry, aggressive. I've got things a little out of order. No, you're good. You're good. Uh, so they they see that Jake and Bobby are. Uh, they're taking it way too serious. And like you were mentioning earlier, John, they have, there's zero backup. 
within like a thousand miles of wherever this happens to be. Like they hit the time of day where all the police officers were drinking in the basement or something. So they. Yeah, uh, I just don't get it. I mean, I watch cops. They always have a car down the street. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so in the recording, it's like really broken up, but you can uh, cry, cry, like he's saying something like red car, you know, cans, like, like all these really weird words that they can't. And cry, cry's like, he's trying to tell us who they are. Uh, and so they it felt very Lassie esque. <laughs> where, where, yeah. Where's Timmy? Is Timmy in the well? <laughs> well. So they send the tape away to have it to have it examined and cleaned up. That, that way they can hear what one of the cops is trying to say and trying to identify who the shooters were, which will be important later because they end up getting more information out of that tape. And before they leave, someone comes up to Crockett and gives him information. We find out that Noogie had done time with Desmond, so he knows who Desmond is. And now is when we jump to jail and they're going to go talk to Noogie again. And apparently, Noogie is in jail, still wearing yeah, his sunglasses. And, this is, mm-hmm. and so we jump right to there. They're in the uh, Crockett and Tubbs are talking to him and they're threatening him. We're going to put you in a cell with Boogaloo Jones and Cell Block C. Yeah. Which yeah. at this it's, point, I'm like, why are all these guys got such great nicknames? <laughs> I know. How do I get like, a nickname? Like, uh, like these are just Jones. the goofiest nicknames. Boogaloo Jones. <laughs> yes, I know. Dominic, you I look like you could be a thing. Boogaloo Jones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the, he comes out and Noogie's got a style, right? Like he don't care. He's gonna talk. He's gonna do whatever he wants. No one tells the Nook man what to do. And as soon as they say that they know that he's connected to. Uh, De- De- Desmond Maxwell, his tone changes real fast. Like that guy's a stone cold killer, not gonna mess with him. That's what they threaten. Like, hey, you know, we heard that. Um, you know who B- Boogaloo Jones is? We're gonna go lock you up with him in cell block C, and that scares no- Noogie enough to cooperate with the veiled threats of from from our duo of like Boogaloo likes quote unquote men like you. I don't know about you, but I I think they're trying to hint that uh-huh. things aren't safe for Nookie's butthole if he goes to stay <laughs> with Boogaloo Jones. How, how could you I, possibly get that? It was so veiled. I think you are correct. And now it makes me question the definition of Boogaloo. That was, that was only for the scholars, Dominic. All right? For the historians. Uh, yeah is boogaloo not a good thing is that a common nickname in that community (laughs) all right so we we leave from noogie's scene where he's gonna cooperate right and they jump to a jamaican town club and that's where the bob marley cover of jamming is playing in the background there's a live band performing it with sean it sounds like that's that may be an actual live band performing that on set Yes. <laughs> so it kind of jumps around. I, I tried to look it up and I saw at least uh, I saw these two places where they claimed the song was being played live. And mm-hmm. then I saw another place that said that the band was lip syncing to mm-hmm. it. So I'm not sure exactly which one. But yeah, I just the song choice, you know, I think it's kind of obvious. I mean, with everything we we talk about how they, they supposedly make, make these really great song choices. And I love Bob Marley. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, Bob Marley jamming is the quintessential generic um, reggae song. Like, mm-hmm. that's – you ask anyone that knows nothing about reggae to name a reggae song, they're going to say jamming. Yeah, well, because yeah. if um, they're going to start knocking stereotypes, they're going to go full bore in this episode. <laughs> yeah. All right? No, no – Exactly, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that and that was kind of uh, my feeling with it was like we're just gonna go straight stereotypes, you know, with the uh, with the awful Jamaican accents. Yeah, yeah. I was surprised. Which were there no Jamaican? His his uh, Jamaican accent. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Me too. So yeah, Noogie comes through. They're at this club. Noogie actually does have a connection with 
Desmond Maxwell and Desmond comes over to come talk to him and Tubbs is dropping his Jamaican accent and which should be like really obvious to these guys right that it's this really forced j- bad j- j- Jamaican accent mm-hmm. so they're able to get yeah. Desmond to take their phone number which turns out to be Noogie's phone number that that uh Crockett gave him and Tubbs doesn't like that he know he he confronts Crockett right there in the club like I don't like how you're playing this one you're cutting too many corners so they uh they kind of have a little argument there right 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 there in the club and Crockett's saying like no these guys are cop killers I'm getting them however I have to I would I'll feel bad if something happens to Noogie but whatever it is it is yeah right. basically he's, he's willing to hang Noogie out to dry on this mm-hmm Mm-hmm. So uh they leave from there and they go back to the precinct. Uh the reason why and sorry, so w- when they're w- when when they leave, that's when they get a call on their gigantic car phone that the shooter's been caught. And so uh Crockett pulls over, Tubbs tells Noogie that that uh, he can leave and he tells Crockett that that they've got the shooter and Crockett's like hey you be safe out there because now he realizes like he's put Noogie in a really bad spot because he hooked him up with Desmond he, Desmond's got his phone number for setting up a $300,000 deal and now mm-hmm. they're just gonna abandon his ass yeah yeah pretty much good luck Noogie <laughs> yeah <laughs> not Nugs. <laughs> so we jump back to, to the precinct where the cops have who they think is the shooter, which is pretty much like we found a Jamaican guy or someone who looks like he's Jamaican driving the van that that was from the shooting at the beginning of the episode, which turns out yes. he's not even Jamaican. He's Haitian. He says it's not him. Hey, man, he's he's got dreadlocks. That's all that matters. <laughs> right. <laughs> and he's been beat up real bad. And so Rocket confronts one of the, op- the the other officer that's there for beating him up so bad and saying, like, you might ruin our case because you beat him up really bad into con- in the trying to make him confess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. And with all the questionable stuff that Crockett's doing in the episode, hanging out, hanging Boogie out to dry like that, you know, it's, it's, it, uh, I, I just don't see how he can get on this cop for banging him around a little bit. It's like you, you're playing just as dirty, Crockett. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So they, after Crockett gets a little upset at that officer, they um, they come walking out and they find out that there's no set status change with Bobby. He's still basically dying, just hanging on for dear life. And then the AV guy, the guy who cleaned up that audio tape. He goes to hand it to him. They're like, no, it's all right. We, we got the shooter. And that AV guy is not about that. He wants you to listen to mm-hmm. that tape. He gets yeah. so pissed. I, I spent three hours on this. <laughs> yeah. My, I, my <laughs> AV guy quickly became my number two favorite of this episode. <laughs> yeah. He is super intense. He's, he's pissed. He's like, what are you talking about? I spent three and a half hours on this tape. Like, I don't give a shit what's on this tape. You better fucking listen to it. <laughs> Uh huh. <laughs> you know what's funny is he it is like he's so over the top about them listening to the tape. They still wait to listen to the tape until Tubbs decides to take Crockett for a drive. Yeah, yeah. So they they leave they tape with him. They go on a drive, and Crockett's driving, and and we know Crockett to be a day drinker. So you know he's a little stressed out. He's had a rough day. Nug man, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, they, they, they deal with the Nug man all day. A couple cops, you know, w- one cop killed. One cop is barely hanging on for dear life. He had a fight with his ex-wife over custody, and his son might be moving to Atlanta, so who knows how often he'll be able to see him. So Croc is not exactly in that good a mood. And he's just like, he's flying down this road, just blowing through red lights, and Tubbs is sitting in the passenger seat, and he ain't saying shit. <laughs> Uh-huh. <laughs> this white boy's gonna kill me. I'm starting to think that Tubbs has got Stockholm syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> so they're fl- he's flying on the road. And he decides, like, like you know, day drinking, driving 100 miles an hour down this road, blowing through red lights. Like, I'm gonna pop in this tape too. 
And so they start yes. listening to the tape, and that's they're able to put together that the guys who shot and killed the police officers, so who they think were the same people in the van in the, in the very beginning, who then shot and killed Bobby and Jake, you know, or uh, mm-hmm. attempted to, that they changed cars. They were in a red El Dorado. They're able to make that out in the tape now. Which, right. just as a side note, I don't think I. Did they make Eldorados in red? I don't think I've ever seen a Eldorado <laughs> in red. Yeah, I mean, I guess you could, it's aftermarket. You can get it painted any color you want to. But yes, so so okay. immediately, yeah, immediately they think about Nookie. Like, oh crap, Nookie's been set up now. Like, Nookie's not safe. You know, like he's not safe. Not necessarily set up, but he's not safe anymore because we don't have the actual shooter. Mm-hmm. And we cut to when they so they called the Nook Man and the Nook Man answered the phone and he's sitting in his underwear, sweaty, like he just got out of a swimming pool, sweaty, with three guys pointing guns mm-hmm. at him. Because that's and the it, trademark of this of this entire TV show is yep. impromptu, overly sweaty people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> Noogie says, like, hey, these guys are here. They're ready to make the deal. Like, this is going to go down now. But it's a setup for Des- for Desmond, who's there. He- De- Desmond's there with two uh, bodyguards, which I'm starting to think Desmond and two bodyguards is the entire gang. There's no one else actually in this gang. And so, and now- I, yeah, I think you're at this point. Yeah, yeah. So... <laughs> Uh, we're gonna. They go back. To, we jump back to 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 the precinct. And they're going through all the planning, and so the 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 lieutenant's going through what people are going to be doing. And Crockett lashes out, and he's like, you know, he's all of a sudden he really cares about Nookie, and he is adamant. He doesn't want anything to happen to the Nook man. Thank God. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and so he says, it basically comes down to like. Crockett's got a different plan, and they're going to use Crockett's plan, and it's the shittiest plan ever, and we're going to get to it in this final scene when we make it back to Noogie's place. The cops are all set up around the building, and Crockett's going to go up to to the apartment to finalize the deal and bring down Desmond Maxwell. I don't know why. I I guess, I guess, sorry, so they need to wait uh, when he comes up, when when Crockett comes in, he's playing it cool, he's going to make the deal, he doesn't have the cash on him yet, so I guess they can't shoot him yet. But that's definitely why they're there, right? They're going to kill Crockett. Right. Uh huh. Yeah. Desmond's there. He's got his Uh, bodyguards. Crockett. Mm -hmm. Well, and so, and at at this point, too, once again, um, uh, we have Crockett going in uh, uh, undercover and. uh, basically, we don't have backup for anybody here. Like, the guys are all out, way outside the building. Yep. Um, yep. Right, like they could have just shot Crockett in the face as soon as he walked in the door. Oh yeah, oh, he yeah. has nobody exactly. backing him up. Yeah. yeah. So, so he walks in. He says he's got the money. He's got all the money with them. It's down in the trunk of his car. Desmond sends one of his bodyguards with, uh. Crockett to go get the money. They go walking down. They're taking their time. Bodyguards got like an M16 kind of rifle with them. Crockett opens up the trunk to his car, and there's our boy Tubbs waiting with. Is it a flashlight? The, the, does he shoot him with a flashlight? It's a it's a 1980s taser. <laughs> <laughs> but here's what I want to know. Apparently, the Jamaican number two has a heart condition because he's just like. Tubbs goes down. I mean, a Crockett goes down and is like feeling his pulse and knocks the gun away, and then he makes that like cut across his across his throat as though he's like, "Well, he's done." But <laughs> yeah. that's not how a taser works. Like a taser doesn't do that. Like it'll it'll immobilize someone. Also, they're taking a pretty just... big risk that that guy didn't have his finger on the trigger, and all of a sudden the shock forces his muscles to contract, and he just unloads. <laughs> yeah. On, on and can I point out that? <laughs> Can I point out that if this Jamaican dude does did die, then have they actually arrested anybody since the show started, or Other is everybody the they were after dead? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I'm pretty sure they've killed everybody. 
yeah, so we're in this, we're in this plot. This is Crockett's idea on how they're going to do this, right? They're going to hide Tubbs in the trunk of the car. They're going to get one of the guards to come down. They're going to taser him. But clearly, but according to their mannerisms, it looks like he's dead. So yeah. they didn't. <laughs> he's dead, Jim. <laughs> and now, because they knew he, they were Jamaicans, they could use Tubbs, who's like the only black guy on the force so far. To put yes. him in the gym in his bodyguard's clothing. That way, when they look out the window, it won't look like anything's amiss. I don't know about you, but I spend a lot of time around another person. I will recognize someone who is similar to someone I know, but is not them, even in the dark from a distance. Well, you know, um, you know, all black guys look the same to Jamaicans. <laughs> yeah, apparently to the the writers and directors to this, like, you know, it's like that's just how they were going to go. And this is Crockett's brilliant plan, right? They're going to now Tubbs and Crockett mm-hmm. are going to go upstairs. One of them's disguised. He's got the briefcase. It's supposed to be full of money. And Tubbs all happy to have a brief scene of him saying like that's a real big suitcase. And so now the last part of Crockett's plan is in full swing. They knock on the door. And when they unlock the door, Crockett's brilliant plan is is to just open fire into the apartment. Yes. Once the door so, opens. So pretty much every episode so far, whoever they were after either escaped on a plane or they just shot down in cold blood. Yeah. And they don't like, we don't see any real evidence against these guys so far. They, at this point, the cops are, you know, it's almost like the police are supposed to know the same thing that we do, but they don't And throughout the whole episode. We've never actually seen any evidence that Desmond Maxwell or these guys are, uh, are going to do what, what, what happens at, at the end of this episode. Yeah. And at the beginning, which is the only time we actually saw them shoot with their automatics, we can't tell if they are actually Desmond and this other guy yeah. uh, and these yeah. bodyguards. Exactly. So, we might have killed the wrong drug dealer here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So his plan is they kick open the door and they just open fire. Somehow, a Nugman, who's in the middle of the room, doesn't get hit. They just unload into there and then the. Oh, because it's in slow motion. So the Nugman, <laughs> moving at a normal speed, can actually walk through the bullets like, <laughs> like Matrix style. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So it's a slow motion door swings open and it's like. Doo, 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 doo. Them unloading and they hit the, the one bodyguard yeah. who goes down and like. You don't see any bullet holes in him. Like he's just going down. Like maybe he has a heart condition or something. And uh-huh. it, like started acting up when the door opened. And he's just like finger on the trigger and he's like shooting his gun through the room as he goes down. And no one else gets hit. Uh these Jamaicans need to watch their cholesterol because they just <laughs> they're just dropping like flies. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so the, um, um they 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 kill that bodyguard now and then they're they've retreated back and the doors De- Desmond closes the door and then you hear the gunshot they open up the door and Desmond has been shot and killed by one of the police snipers on the building across the street. Right, which good luck mm-hmm. because for all of all of uh, Crockett caring uh, caring about how Nugs was going to get out of there alive. He just straight starts shooting, has everyone firing, and then retreats and leaves Nugs in there with Desmond holding a gun to him. Yeah, exactly. Like, exactly. oh, darn. And in the process, <laughs> the Nug man gets hit in the arm. That's that he gets that, you know. So, so, so he does get hit once in the process of like mm-hmm. three hundred bullets being fired in this whole exchange. Right, which I think that he did a great job because he's like. Yes. Oh, I'm dying. I want to live. I want to die. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He's got like like a graze on his arm. Uh-huh. And that pretty much wraps up so that scene. The episode we have... wraps up with. Mm-hmm. Yep, we go to the hospital. The very end of the episode wraps up with um, we go to the hospital. Noogs is leaving the hospital. He's going to hop in, and we kind of get that little exchange between Nugs and Crockett like this is going to be a regular thing and I Nugs know. finishes the episode by uh, singing Rapper's Delight yeah, he as he drives off or, or rapping Rapper's Delight as he hops in, uh, in the convertible and drives off 
What else would you expect from your number one informant? Yeah, yeah, th- that was really yes. awkward how so, that how that ends. So, um, like, I understand they're trying to set up. They know throughout the rest of the season, like the Doug Man's going to come back. We need to make sure this is opened up so that we we can use his character again. But man, was the writing on that so bad of like him just like dropping out like right? Like, yeah, you count on me. I'm going to oh, be here. Oh, I'm your number I one know. informant. Yeah, it was bad. Yeah. Yep. So, yes, yes, sir. Read Jim about, and then, the, and then, and then at the very end, the rap. It's like, like really, yeah. Like, like it just got worse all the way <laughs> through it. Yeah, yeah. So they were there. They give the Nook Man a gift. It's some chocolates. Who he and he and he doesn't like those kind of like the turtles, turtles. or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> turtles. And, and then they're there to see uh, uh, Jake or Bobby, whichever one. He's not going to die. He's he's going to make it. Thumbs up. He's he's all right. He's going to live. <laughs> yeah. And that that concludes <laughs> season one, episode four, Miami Vice. Uh, oh, it ends with Tubbs checking out a nurse. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> so, and that that concludes Cool Running. Let's uh, let's go on and talk about the little bit of music that was in this episode. Turns out, this director, I, like I said, I got to look up some more information about this director because I, I doubt he was back. One of the things that Miami Vice is known for is popular music. And in this episode, we have one song actually actually played and a reference to another one. So we only have two technical songs that we're going to talk about in this segment. The first is Bob Marley's Jammin', which was released in, I believe it's 1977 is when that song was released. Good which, song. Yes. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. a good song, but I think, John, you're and right. So you with, you with this, covered it um, a lot er- earlier, you know, that this was kind of forced in there. Like they had to choose a song. So they chose the most cookie cutter reggae song they could. Yeah. And I kept trying to find the reason why it would have been significant at that time, but there was nothing. So in 77, it came out. Um, Bob Marley died. I want to say 81. Um, and then the song became popular again in 1987. And it was re-released as a tribute uh, by the Whalers. So at no point in 84 was this song ever culturally, uh, did it ever come up culturally relevant again? Mm-hmm. So uh, that was the only thing I could think is that they just went for the most generic reggae song they could find. Mm-hmm. Which I think is weird because in past episodes, we've remarked on how they found like things that were more obscure, like B-sides of more famous artists or mm-hmm. things that were, I, I guess, more like uh, you got to dig and find them. So this seemed like a an overly obvious choice for them mm-hmm. to, to do. Like I would have expected just to keep on theme with what the music has been so far for them to find something that's more underground that yeah. had that same like Jamaican yeah. flavor to it. Well, and, and the same thing goes like the the only other music reference is the song Rapper's Delight by the Sugar Hill Gang mm-hmm. uh, at the end of the episode, which once again, 1980s when it came out, and it is like the most generic rap song they could have chosen. Did it come out um, in the 80s or did it come out in the 70s? Yeah, it, might it, be came, the 70s. Out it, it came out in 1980. I thought it came out in, in the 70s. I can I can Google it again, but for Wikipedia was saying it was 1980. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Um, so yeah, so still, that's four them, years before this was filmed. So yeah, and, and not, it is neither the, of them are like you know charting. Uh, and it is the most generic or, rap song. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. So I mean that pretty much covers like all the music that was in this episode. It's kind of a letdown, especially compared to Heart of Darkness and the music that was in that one. So let's finish this up and let's move on to our final thoughts. Okay, so I don't know how much of our so, final thoughts we have here. Let's kind of go around and see, you know, kind of close up. John, you got a you got a little information about the Nug Man. So yeah, I did want to bring it up. Um, the Nug Man, who's uh, who was name uh, whose actual name is Charlie Barnett. Charlie Barnett was a comedian. Um, Back in that to- uh, time frame, and kind of his claim to fame was that he was almost famous. So, um, he actually was auditioned by 
uh, Saturday Night Live, um, and, and he actually he almost got the part. He he ended up skipping his final audition because um, he, uh, from according to Wikipedia, he was self conscious con uh, conscious over um, uh, some stuff, and the part ended up going to Eddie Murphy. That's so, crazy. I mean, that's really um, crazy. So right there, you know, there's he was one audition. That's just a crazy scenario. Like, yeah, exactly. To think about exactly. That. You know, mm-hmm. um, he was one audition away from being Eddie Murphy or having that career path in front of yeah. him, you know? Yeah. Um, and so the other thing that caught my attention is that Dave Chappelle um, has said, has publicly mm-hmm. said that Charlie Barnett was an influence of his. Um, because Charlie Barnett did do a little bit of Def Jam circuit uh, at the very beginning of Def Jam uh, Comedy Jam. Mm-hmm. And so Dave should have said, and I think you can kind of see that when you look at the character of Noogie and you look at some of Dave Chappelle's characters in his skits. Uh-huh. Um, I think you can see where he kind of takes that influence. Yeah. Um, so, but the thing is, is that. Uh, Charlie Burnett actually died tragically. He contracted HIV through heroin use, and he actually passed away in 1996. And Dave Chappelle had talked about in interviews that he had he had explored at one point in time trying to do a biopic pick of Charlie Burnett. I mean, that's crazy. That's crazy about about the Nook Man and, and his background. John, what are your kind of what are your fi- final thoughts on this episode well i think um this episode um um i think with this episode that it was surprising to me how generic it was and then the awful slow-mos and just the the really bad attempts at comedy through it um uh i i I just i think this is kind of a freak and adoration of an episode i don't expect us to go down this path too much more but i do expect to see a lot of the nerd man yeah. and um i i actually i, I he was the only thing i like about this episode so hopefully the future episodes with him aren't aren't like this episode hopefully they're better yeah i know um so- uh, his character i can see how in the future he's gonna be a good relief at some times if they can use him right he seems like the Huggy Bear character of this, mm-hmm. referencing Starsky and Hutch with the uh, Huggy Bear reoccurring character. Um, that seems to be what Noogie's supposed to be. And so uh, I'm interested to see if every episode is like this that he's in. Yep. Yep. So, Jenna, what are your closing thoughts here on this, the cool run-in episode of Miami Vice? This episode, I just, I'm glad that we're through it and we can move on. And I hope that we get back into, clearly, the dramatic side of things is a better suit for this show. So I hope that either they stick closer to that than including more of that comedy that they've been, I guess, trying at, or that they get better at it. Um, but overall the episode was just super clunky for me and I really didn't care for it. And I especially didn't care for the way that it was painting like Sonny, like he's been a a conflicted character in the past and I'm really interested in that arc of his, uh, as a character, but was just really not into, he seemed just super selfish and short sighted in this episode. And it wasn't the same kind of being caught between two worlds or like wanting to be a better father and a better cop or, or anything like that. Um, it was all just like, want your cake and eat it too. want to date, uh, Gina want to still be married, want my kid and can't provide a safe environment for him. You know, want to play it dangerously with people, but, uh, still be considered the best cop ever. And I don't know, it bugged me. So I hope that that stops. Mm-hmm. You know, my last thought. And once on... again, mm-hmm. go ahead, John. And and once again, female Tubbs and Crockett are not important to the show whatsoever. No, no. And you know, my final thoughts on this episode are: you know, I had a lot of good laughs on this episode, but none of them were intentional by the director or the writing staff. It was just having a good time. It's just how awkward and clunky, especially the Nook Man was in this episode you know i it was a lot of fun watching it but it was for a lot of fun for all the wrong reasons it wasn't necessarily my favorite Mm -hmm. miami vice 
episode so far i mean we are so early on there's going to be a lot more episodes where we might look back at this one and still have you know look back on it fondly i will That's say true. in mm-hmm. the last two you know in the last week or two and watching these episodes of my advice i have to say like i went to- into this not expecting to like Miami Vice, but to have the experience I had in this episode, which is laugh at how awkward things are and how weird the 80s were and and Don Johnson's hair and, you know, have a good time with it. But I have to say, mm-hmm. Miami Vice as a whole isn't necessarily that great of a show, It's but I love it. I love watching. I love watching this show. It's one of my favorite mm-hmm. things that I do throughout the week is watching this show. And it has something to do with Miami Vice and just how, how they do the stories. And yeah, it can be awkward and clunky and kind of weird at times. But I think I'm in love with Don Johnson. I'm right there with you. <laughs> <laughs> and I agree with you. I think coming into this, I thought that all the episodes were going to be like this episode. And then with the first two episodes we went through... Um, suddenly I was surprised by this episode, you know, like it almost seemed like, like I came into it with low expectations. I was Mm -hmm. impressed. And then now I'm back to kind of, well, this is kind of what I expected. So, yeah. Yeah. So I think that's going to do it for this week for go with the heat. And we hope you enjoy listening to us ramble on and get some dirty details about this, the fourth episode of season one of Miami Vice titled Cool Running. Hope you hang out with us and come back next week and check out our next episode. I have no idea what, what to expect out of the next one now based on how this one was, but how the pre- previous two were. So, I mean, who knows what's going to get thrown at us next week. I did cheat a little bit and see something. So I think we're in for a couple of great episodes in a row. So I'm, again, I'm mm-hmm. pretty excited about uh, just based on the title. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I think that's going to do it for this for this week. Make sure to subscribe and keep checking in on our episode. And we'll see you all next week. Bye, pals. Bob's. Bye.